Corey's work has long challenged us to consider the impact of this digital transformation. As librarians and readers, we are pleased to have this well-known speaker here in person. Please join me in welcoming Corey Doctorow. For a library in Washington County, I'm uh, someone who used to work in a big central branch library and, and it always feels like homecoming to come back and, and stay in one of these, these great community hubs. And Portland is one of my favorite places in the world, so coming to Portland is, is super fun. And I don't actually say that everywhere I go, most places are not my favorite places in the world. <laughs> Portland actually is one of my favorite places in the world. So, but as you heard, I've got a book coming out called Information Doesn't Want to Be Free. And you may have heard that information wants to be free, or whether the information wants to be free, or what information wants is kind of at the center of questions about copyright in the digital age and, and information policy. But, you know, I decided to delve into this subject. So I invited information for a kind of soul searching weekend in the Hamptons. And so we rented out this little house and we went away for the weekend and we, we drank Oki Chardonnay talked about our parents, we cried a little. When it was over, information gave me a long, soulful hug and whispered in my ear and confessed that the only thing that it wants is for us to stop anthropomorphizing it. <laughs> <laughs> information, of course, doesn't want anything. Information's an abstraction. It has no desires. <clears throat> People want to be free. And when you live in a world that is tied together by information and information technology, the destiny of information is intimately bound up in the freedom of so um, I'm going to talk a little tonight about information policy and uh, what it looks like and where it's going and how that affects all of us. And the talk starts with a little anecdote uh, uh, that a friend told me. He used to work at one of the big consumer packaged goods companies. These are the companies that fill the aisles of your grocery store or your pharmacy and make the soap and detergent and, and uh, all of that other stuff that you see there. Very marketing driven. Marketing the marketing departments go off and research product designs and then they bring them to the engineering department to be built. And one day, the marketing department came back from their Ayurvedic retreat or whatever it is marketing departments do, and uh, came to the engineers and they said, guys, we figured it out. We know what people want. What they want, you're going to love this, is a detergent that makes their clothes newer when they wash them. <laughs> so the marketing department tried for some time to explain the second law of thermodynamics and entropy too. <laughs> the engineering department tried to just explain this to the marketing department, gave it up as a bad job, and realized that when non-technical people say things, they sometimes mean them in non-technical senses. And that the marketing department didn't want a detergent that made your clothes newer, they would be happy with a detergent that made your clothes look newer. And that's an entirely different matter. Because um, the, uh, there are these hot water activated <coughs> enzymes that dissolve fiber ends. And a broken fiber that makes your clothes look old, that has twice as many ends as an intact fiber. So if you wash your laundry with this enzyme in, in hot water, your clothes come out looking newer, it's great. Now, your clothes are actually the opposite of newer because they're being digested in the wash water. <laughs> a lot older, a lot quicker. But as delusions go, this is a pretty harmless one, right? The distinction between looks newer and is newer is, is for the purposes of people who, um, for whom have, you know, disposing of clothes that they've grown tired of so they can go and buy new clothes in an age of, of material abundance, the clothes getting older faster is, is not a, a bug, but a, a feature even. Um, but not every technical delusion is as harmless as that one. And sometimes when we use technical terms in non-technical ways, we run up against the limits of the analogy. And that can get us into trouble, and that's really what tonight's talk is about. So the world that we live in is increasingly built out of network computers. Um, we don't just have computers in our pockets and in our bags and on our desks anymore. We often put our bodies into computers. If you came here in a modern car, chances are you were in a computer that hurtled down the road at 60 miles an hour with you inside of it. Um, many modern buildings are computers that you happen to live in or work in. And when you take the computers out, they become uninhabitable almost instantaneously. And if you leave them out for any appreciable length of time, probably have to tear them down and start over again because of the mold and other things that set in without the computerized HVAC systems. And the Boeing 747 that I flew from London to the United States in, that's a flying Sun Solaris workstation in a very fancy, very expensive aluminum case connected to some extremely tragically badly secured SCADA controllers. Um, <laughs> so it's not just though that we have our bodies inside of computers, increasingly we have computers inside of our bodies. So. Um, 
Uh, if you, like me, grew up with a Walkman, or if you grew up with an MP3 player, you will have logged enough punishing earbud hours that there will come a day, if you're lucky enough to live long enough, when you'll need a hearing aid. And it's vanishingly unlikely that that hearing aid is going to be a retro beige hipster plastic analog transistorized hearing aid, right? It's going to be a computer that you put inside your body. And that computer will know what you hear. It will be able to make you hear things that aren't there. It'll be able to stop you from hearing things that are there. And depending on how it's designed, it may be able to tell other people what you're hearing without you knowing about it. So the destiny of computers in our bodies becomes extremely sharp and pointy the more we think about it. You know, for example, there's a researcher named Barnaby Jack, died tragically last summer, but about a year before he died, he gave an amazing presentation to a security conference in Australia about his work researching the security model of implanted defibrillators. So implanted defibrillators are super cool. If you or someone you know has a heart uh, that is starting to lose the, lose the picture here and starts to um, uh, seize up and not keep a good rhythm and maybe threaten the life of the person who uh, depends on that heart, you can go to the doctor and she'll anesthetize you, cut you open, spread your ribs, reach into your chest cavity and attach a computer to your heart, the powerful battery that listens to your heart beating and when it loses the rhythm, it gives you a shock that brings you back to life. Now, doctors want to be able to get telemetry off these things, find out what they're doing. They want to be able to update them, you know, put new versions of their software on them with new features or that repair old bugs. And it's kind of messy to attach a cable to a computer that's inside your chest cavity. So these things have wireless interfaces, just like everything in our world has a wireless interface. That's why mostly our, our built environment these days resembles a microwave oven, electromagnetically speaking. So these things have wireless interfaces that you can use to listen to them and to talk to them. And Barnaby Jack showed that from about 10 yards away, he could take over the wireless interface in your implanted defibrillator and reprogram it and cause it to look for other wireless interfaces on other implanted defibrillators, like when you went to the hospital to get your defibrillator serviced and you were on a ward full of other people with defibrillators, reprogram those so that they went out and did the same thing. And then, at a time of his choosing, administer a lethal shock to all the people who had infected. <laughs> this is extremely sharp and pointy end of having implanted computers, computers in your body. And there's a reason Dick Cheney's implanted defibrillator had its wireless interface turned off. <laughs> You know, I was in an airport lounge a little while ago, and uh, the first rule of the airport lounge is always be charging ABC. So I ran for the only plug, and I plugged my laptop in. It was the first one there. And I'm feeling very smug about myself, and a guy comes in, and very cheekily, I thought, said, uh, can I use that plug? And I said, well, I'm using it to charge my laptop. And he rolled up his pants leg and said, I need it to charge my leg. And he had a robotic artificial leg from the knee down. And I was like, you can have the plug. <laughs> So, our bodies and computers, computers and our bodies, the world made of computers, that means that every problem in the world is going to involve computers, because computers become one of the central facts of the world. That means that every problem is always going to invite a solution, which is regulating computers, because if maybe if you can change the way the computers work, you can get rid of the problem. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Now, as it turns out, for the last 15 years, we've been running an experiment in regulating computers to solve a social problem, and that's the copyright wars. So for 15 years, governments have been passing a series of laws, um, uh, ever more strict, ever more wide, uh, that attempt to regulate computers to control how people watch movies and, and uh, read books and listen to music and so on. And um, by examining that copyright wars evidentiary record, we can get a picture, first of all, of the likelihood that breaking computers is going to work to solve social problems, even big and important and urgent social problems, with much more moment than how you watch TV, but also what, this, what the consequences will be, what the side effects are of using computer regulation to solve social problems, whether they're big or small. So let's go back to the earliest days of this stuff, this project to control how people uh, use computers in the name of, of protecting uh, copyright. So, in the 1980s, the primary thing that people were concerned about copying was uh, programs. And programs came on floppy disks. And they wanted to make sure that you didn't copy the floppy disk. There was even a song called Copy That Floppy. And uh, there were lots of techniques tried to make this happen. Uh, sometimes the manufacturers, they would actually like burn out a sector on the disk before they shipped it to you. And then when the program ran, it would say, can I read sector 7G? And uh, there's a little Simpsons reference. 
And uh, if it could read Sector 7G, then it would know that that was not the disk that came from the factory, that it was a copy. And it would say, sorry, I'm not allowed to run, right? Um, and so that was a way that they could, they could try and restrict copying. Sometimes they'd say, uh, turn to page 922 of the analysis <coughs> manual and locate the third word of the fourth paragraph and tell me what that is. Uh, because photocopying manuals was expensive while, while copying floppy disks was cheap. They tried all kinds of things and they got as, as the realm of things that um, were copyable and that were sold in a digital form expanded the techniques expanded too. They wanted to control how you use books, they wanted to control how you use movies, and so on. And if you think back on all of those experiments since the 1980s and right up to the very moment, the one thing that you will recall is that none of this stuff has ever really worked worth a damn. Right? Everything that anyone wanted to copy was copyable just about the moment that it hit, that it, it, you know, it met reality. Um, and there's a reason for this. There's a reason for, for how this stuff, for, for um, for why this stuff always broke. And to understand it, you have to understand some basics of cryptography and security. And there's no math in this. This is just about kind of the concepts of how this stuff works. And it's good to know this stuff. It's good to understand this stuff. And with your kind indulgence, I'll explain a little of it now. So here's the idea. I want to uh, give you a movie, but control how you watch it. And so I scramble the movie, and I give it to you. And then I give you a program that can descramble the movie by using a key that's embedded in the program to descramble it so that you can watch it. And every time the program runs, it says, am I allowed to descramble the movie? And it checks its environment. Am I in the right country? Am I in the right computer? Am I the original program? Um, and if it thinks that it's allowed to descramble the movie, it descrambles the movie and lets you watch it, and then it throws it away. And um, that's the idea, is that it can, it can control how you use it by making sure that you only use um, the authorized program to describe the, the movie. Now, this bears a kind of superficial cargo cultish resemblance to what we do when we do real information security, like when we try to protect the information that you send to the bank, or try to make sure that your email is protected, or try to make sure that the storage on your phone is protected so that if someone, if you lose it and someone picks it up, they can't read all the information on it without knowing the right password. Even if they take the, the storage out and plug it into another device, it still won't be something they can make sense of. But when you delve into it, you see that it's, it's uh, not at all real cryptography. It's a kind of voodoo cryptography. Now, real cryptography, um, we use the example of three people locked in a perennial love triangle, Alice and Bob and Carol. And there's even love songs about Alice and Bob and Carol if you look around on the internet. Some of them are quite poignant. Um, and Alice and Bob want to share a secret, and they don't want Carol to know what it is. They want to send a message between one another. They don't want Carol to know what it is. And so Alice and Bob scramble the message. And they send, uh, Alice sends the message that's been scrambled to Bob. And Alice and Bob assume that Carol can intercept the message while it's in the air between them. Because maybe it's being sent over a wireless network or the public internet. Or maybe Carol is an adversary like a government or a phone company that can see all the traffic. Whatever it is, they say, we better assume that Carol's going to see the scrambled message. They also assume that Carol knows how the message was scrambled, that they know the technique used to scramble the message. And that's because, like every other technical discipline, the only way to figure out whether or not you've invented something that works or whether you're just kidding yourself is to tell other people how you think it works to see if someone else out there has, can think of a thing that you missed when you started designing the system. Uh, Bruce Schneier, the <coughs> cryptographer, says anyone can design a security system that works against people who are dumber than him. But unless you're the smartest person in the world, you know, unless you're the smartest coyote, the roadrunner is going to get out of your trap, right? You have to tell as many people as you can. You know, if you think back on the history of science, before we had science, we had alchemy. Alchemy looks a lot like science, except you don't tell people what you've learned, and so every alchemist discovers for himself that drinking mercury is a bad idea. Alchemy kind of stalls out. We call that 500-year period the Dark Ages. And when, when alchemists start publishing and telling other people what they do, we call that the Enlightenment. Right? We call what they do science, and all of a sudden we get the, the enlightenment and the great blossoming of technology that has followed since. Um, and so it is with cryptography. Right? If you invented a way of scrambling and descrambling messages, you tell other people, because maybe you made a dumb mistake, maybe you missed something. I mean, it turns out that there could be mistakes that lots of people missed for years and years. Uh, you may remember last spring, Heartbleed, um, that there was this huge deep, important bug in a, in a piece of code used all over the internet to secure communications. A bug that was so serious 
that Bruce Schneier, the security expert, he called it an 11 on a scale of 1 to 10 and advised people to just not use their computers for about a week until it had been fixed and then change their passwords, right? And this was code that had been floating around for years and years and lots of people had looked at and missed. So you need this scrutiny. Bob and Alice assume that the thing that they're using to scramble their messages is subject to scrutiny and um, adversarial scrutiny that, that everyone is looking at and trying to find the mistakes that they've made. So how are Alice and Bob able to communicate in secret if Carol can get the message and knows how it was scrambled? Well, Carol doesn't know the key. So long as Alice and Bob keep the key a secret, maybe they share it beforehand, maybe they use another clever method like uh, symmetrical keys, which we can go into at another time. But they manage to have, by just having one tiny little secret, this little key, they can keep the secrecy and the integrity of the whole system. But how does this work in the realm of digital locks, or what are, what's called digital rights management? I'll use those terms interchangeably tonight. I don't like copy protection. I was a systems administrator. I know that the way that you protect data is by making a copy of it. Uh, copy prevention is nice, but it's a bit cute. So I'm going to say digital rights management or digital locks tonight. And um, how does this work in the digital locks, digital rights management world? Well, you've got Bob, who made the movie and the DVD decoder that's going to let you watch the movie. And um, then you've got Alice, which is everybody who wants to watch the movie. And Bob gives Alice the movie, the scrambled movie, the program to be scramble it. And then Bob puts the key inside the program that he gives to Alice. And he thinks that the program will keep the key a secret from Alice, and that Alice will never be able to get the key out of the program that she has sitting there on her laptop in her living room where she can work on it without anyone seeing what she's doing for as long as she wants under ideal circumstances. And the smartest person in the world who wants to watch a movie can be that Alice just by going out and buying a DVD player and can get access to it. And you can choose which DVD player you attack. You can attack the one that was made by the stupidest person and get the keys out and it works just as well as if you break the most uh, the best protected DVD player. So in crypto, we have a, a technical term for this model. It's called wishful thinking. <laughs> because somewhere out there is an Alice who isn't just clever, but is like a bored grad student with an electron tunneling microscope and a grudge. Right? <laughs> and that Alice is going to get your keys out. And when she does, she can do all kinds of things that totally blow up your security model. Right? She can make a DVD player that plays DVDs and then saves them uh, by descrambling them. Um, or she can tell other people where the keys are. Or she can tell other people what the key is. The key is just a short little number after all. Or she can make copies of movies that aren't restricted and she can share those and, and put them out on the internet where people can get at them. We see people do all of these things. And whichever one of these things she does, it stops working. The, the digital log system stops working. It's, it's a break once, break everywhere. Uh, kind of security system. And that's why it's never ever worked very well, not because the engineers who made it were stupid, but because they were on a fool's errand. Now, um, I'm not here, though, to talk primarily about the relationship of this digital copying and digital log stuff to the arts, um, because I think that's kind of a sideshow, right? Whether or not you are allowed to watch a movie in the way you prefer, whether or not people who make movies can control how you watch movies. Those are off to one side, really. Because honestly, the number of people out there who are earning even an appreciable fraction of their income from the arts, they're tiny little rounding error against the whole population of people who use computers and are affected by information policy. Now, admittedly, I'm one of those people. So that's a question of some moment to me. But I think it's a real category error to assume that just because something is super important to you and all the people who make their living in the same weird, improbable way as you, who represent a tiny fraction of the total world, that it actually matters beyond your little bubble. And I don't think it matters beyond my little bubble. I think it matters a lot within my little bubble, but unless you happen to be someone as, as likely as a, a lottery winner or a lightning strike victim, depending on your view of the arts, um, it probably doesn't matter an enormous amount to you at least not as much as the bigger questions of what it means to break people's computers to solve social problems matters. So that's what the talk is really about. The, the harm that we get when we use technology to solve social problems, when we use laws and rules about technologies to solve social problems. Uh, the copyright wars were the first salvo in the war, so let's examine that. And to do that, we have to start with an international treaty-making agency that's part of the United Nations called WIPO, 
WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, which has the same relationship to the copyright laws of the world that Mordor has to evil. It's where they all come from. <laughs> <laughs> and um, in 1996, WIPO decided that it was time to modernize the world's copyright systems for the digital age. And so they passed something called the WIPO Copyright Treaty, or WCT, that was aimed at protecting digital rights management and digital lock systems as a, kind of its first duty. And all over the world, countries passed laws to come into compliance with the treaty. In the United States, in 1998, they passed the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA. You've probably seen those initials on the internet. They come up a lot, as in, this video is no longer available due to a claim under the DMCA. Um, they, in uh, Australia, it came in through the Australia-US Free Trade Agreement. A lot of countries around the world passed it as part of their free trade agreements with the US Trade Representative, who went ahead and said, you know, if you want to sell soybeans to Americans, you've got to pass this, this law. Um, in uh, in uh, the European Union, it came in through the European Union Copyright Directive, and uh, in Canada, where I'm from, it came in through Bill C-11, and C-11 is a bit weird because it's like a 2012-2013 bill, and to make dumb mistakes about the internet in 1996 just means that you're not much of a futurist, right? But to make <laughs> dumb mistakes about the internet in 2011-2012 is like felony stupidity. <laughs> right? to, 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 to not even notice that this stuff is kind of important by then really is embarrassing. Um, and what do the laws do? Well, they make it illegal to break digital logs. They make it illegal to tell people how to break digital logs. They make it illegal to tell people what the keys are. They make it illegal to tell people where the keys are. They make it illegal to share the keys. And they make it illegal, and this is the really important part for the rest of tonight's talk, they make it illegal to um, uh, tell people information that they could use to break the digital lock. So to report flaws in the digital lock that could be used to bootstrap an attack that would take the digital lock off, off altogether. And what this all amounts to is a prohibition on what's called reverse engineering. Uh, a, a digital lock in order to add new features to it or plug new devices into it. So that's a pretty traditional thing, right? A company sells you a, 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 a dishwasher or washing machine and another company says, you know, they charge a lot of money for the, for the fan belts on these things. We can make them a lot cheaper. Why don't we take one apart, reverse engineer it, figure out how to make that fan belt and we'll sell it even cheaper. And normally, that kind of reverse engineering and compatibility, that's considered like the bedrock of good economic policy. It keeps companies from having abusive relationships with people who have a sunk investment in an expensive piece of capital like a car or a washing machine or a dishwasher. And it also makes sure that there's this vibrant and innovative world of people adding new stuff, new value to the things that you own. Think of all the things you can plug into your car's cigarette lighter. Right? Manufacturers didn't come up with that. Third parties came up with it. And now, even though people have pretty much stopped smoking, your car still has a lighter because all the things you can do with a lighter are so much are so valuable that um, they, they couldn't leave the, the little, now, 12-volt socket and not cigarette lighter out. <laughs> when you give a, a company the right to stop other people from interoperating with it, it turns out to be something of an attractive nuisance. It becomes an almost irresistible temptation to add just enough digital lock stuff to make sure that your competitors can't come in and start to gore your rocks and attack your bottom line. And uh, DVDs are a really good way to understand this in a kind of uh, universal context because we've all seen them and used DVDs. So let's have a little thought experiment. Imagine you go back to 1996, and because it's 1996, you can go into a Tower Records. <laughs> and Tower Records, <laughs> has just started stocking a new technology called DVDs. And right alongside of it are their CDs. And in one pocket you have $1,000 for CDs, in the other pocket you have $1,000 for DVDs. And you bring your collection of shiny discs up to the counter and you pay your money, you go back home and you just stick them all in a vault. And you open it up today, 18 years later. What do you get? Well, normally when you lock technology up in a vault for 18 years, it gets negative value, right? It turns into e-waste. You have to pay other people to take it away because it's become toxic trash. But a funny thing's happened to those CDs in 18 years, because 18 years ago, all you could do with a CD was play it. But in the intervening 18 years, because there's no digital lock on a CD, and that means that anyone can make a thing that adds functionality to a CD, like iTunes, now, 
you can rip it and mix it and burn it. You can make mixed discs. You can stream it. You can make it into alarm tones and ringtones. You can load it onto all your devices. You can back it up. You can share it. You can make it the background music of your wedding video. You can make it the background music of your school project. You can make it the background music of your YouTube video. You can do anything, pretty much, you can think of with that music on those CDs. And all of those features, all of that new value has accrued to you by dint of you just having waited while technology moved along and unlocked new value and property that you bought, right? Gave you an interest and a dividend on the property you own. Now DVDs, 18 years ago, all you could do with it is watch it. 18 years later, what can you legally do with a DVD? Watch it. Although there, it's not very hard to write a program that reads a DVD into a computer and lets you do all kinds of things with it, in fact, not long after the DVD was first introduced, a Norwegian teenager named Jan Johansson, whom they call DVD Jan, Jan Johansson and a, and a few of his friends in an afternoon for giggles broke the DVD. Uh, so that, and since then, we've had programs like Handbrake and VLC that are easy enough to get on the internet, but are not particularly polished and are illegal to sell and illegal to possess and illegal to distribute. Um, and uh, there are no products in the marketplace. You can't go into a store. You can't download from an app store anything that will let you read a DVD and add features to it that the movie studios don't want you to have, even if you want to have those features, and even if the law would otherwise allow you to have those features. So this is an enormous gift to the studios, because they can um, choose to unlock that value for you one little piece at a time, and then charge you money for it. So there is a way to get the movies you own on DVD onto your tablet. You can buy them again. Right? That's how you can get the watch it on your tablet feature. Um, unlike with your CD, where you could just load it onto your tablet, you have to pay to unlock that feature. And if there's a feature they don't want to add, that feature just never shows up. Um, for my sins, I used to go to digital rights management standards meetings. And John Oliver uh, very wisely said, if you want to do something very evil, wrap it up in something very boring. And I think standards meetings are what he had in mind. Um, and in the European Union, they were arguing about what the standards would be for digital rights management and digital TV, high definition digital TV. And I would go to these incredibly bad meetings wearing uncomfortable suits and sit there for days and days trying to argue that there shouldn't be any, which was not a very popular position. And um, at one point, there was a proposal from the Motion Picture Association of America, Red, who said, um, I want there to be a flag that a broadcaster can set when the broadcaster puts a show out on cable or satellite or, or over the air that says that this program can only be watched in the same room as the receiver and can't be retransmitted to your bedroom or your kitchen or uh, your garage. Um, and I said, so which copyright system is it that you imagine allows a copyright holder to tell you what room you're allowed to watch TV in? And he said, well, this is not about which copyright system says what. This is about value. And there is value in watching a program in one room when it's being received in another room. And if it has value, then we have the right to that value. And so we should be able to decide whether or not you're going to get that value. Now, Siva Vadyantan is a very astute scholar of these things. He, he calls this the if value, then right theory. But I, I have another name for it. I call it the urinary tract infection business model. <laughs> because if you think about all the value locked up in that DVD, it flowed in a very nice, healthy, easy gush, right? But the value locked up in your DVDs comes out in a slow, painful, burning trip. <laughs> Each feature costs money, you have to ask permission for it, and it's never as good as you hoped it would be. <laughs> and you not only get to take away value from people, you get to choose which value you get, you can actually introduce anti-features, things that nobody wants, and force them to use these anti-features, like the unskippable commercial on your DVD player or your PVR. Um, so the way that that works is if you're going to uh, make a DVD player, because it's illegal to share keys or download keys or publish keys, the only way to get the keys is to license them from the body that, that makes the DVD players, the, the motion picture cartel. And as a condition of that license, they say you have to promise that you will honor the no skip bit. And so if you come across some video that's marked don't skip this, you, you can't let the person sitting in front of the DVD player skip the video. Uh, now, anti-features and features that you want to control, 
they're kind of a difficult business to, to actually make work because of this Alice involving Carol business. Right? If, they're, if you ask your computer to do something, and instead of saying, yes, master, your computer says, I can't let you do that, Dave, <laughs> then you're going to be upset, and you're going to look for a program called HAL9000.exe, and you're going to bring it into the trash. Right? And you're going to open up the process manager, and you're going to look for a program running called HAL9000.exe, and you're going to kill that program with extreme prejudice. So how do you stop people who own a computer from deleting programs on it, from killing programs on it? Well, you have to design the computer from the ground up to hide things from the person who owns it, to obfuscate its functionality, to not list all the programs on it, to not list all the files on it, to hide and obscure and mislead the person who is using the computer. And um, there, that runs up against a really important uh, principle and how we design computers to be as secure and robust as possible, which is the principle of openness. So we have this stuff, open source free software, that um, is designed so that anyone who uses it is allowed to look at how it runs, to understand how it runs, to improve how it runs, and to share their improvements. And that freedom and openness has given us all kinds of innovation. Uh, it's the basis for Android, it's the basis for Mac, iOS, uh, Mac OS, um, it's the basis for um, uh, Linux, it's the basis for all the servers that we use. All this stuff comes out of this free and open source world. But free and open source is not compatible with the idea that you have a program that treats the person using it as the enemy. Because if you're the enemy, then you can't be privy to the uh, program's internal workings. You're not allowed to go in and change the thing that says, I can't let you do that, Dave, to yes, master, because that defeats the whole purpose of the exercise. Now, allowing companies to control uh, all the end uses and the modifications of their tools isn't just bad for people um, who are interested in policy questions about competition. It's not just bad for free software advocates. It's not just bad for people who want to unlock as much value as possible in their property. It's also bad for um, the most marginal groups of people, the people who have already start with the greatest disadvantages in our world. So for example, people with disabilities often find that their special needs aren't taken into consideration in the design of products. Now, to the extent that they or the organizations that advocate for them are legally allowed to modify those products and offer those modifications to their uh, constituents, then people who have physical disabilities, people who have sensory disabilities, and people who have mental disabilities can get tools that are better suited to their needs, even if a bunch of people who don't have to think about this stuff and, aren't, and, and don't care about those people in any particular way because they don't represent any kind of market segment that their investors will allow them to care about in any meaningful way, um, they can still get value out of the stuff that they need. And all of us are really only temporarily able-bodied. Right? If you live long enough, you will be partially or completely disabled at some point in your life, and maybe for a long period of, at the end of your life. And so this stuff is stuff that affects all of us. The other group of people that it really affects are people living in the developed world, uh, or developing world, rather. People in the developing world have their own special needs, and even though they are numerous, they don't have the same economic clout that people in the rich, developed north have. And so oftentimes, when technology companies make products, they don't really think about how those products might be used by, say, schoolhouses in rural sub-Saharan Africa, um, where there's uh, only intermittent electricity, only intermittent network access, and not a lot of uh, money or technical experts on hand. But if people are allowed to modify these tools themselves, it turns out that all over the developing world there are people who are technical experts, who do know what the local needs are, and who can modify technology to make it suit their needs on the ground. The most popular flavor of the GNU Linux operating system is a flavor called Ubuntu that was developed for use in rural schoolhouses in impoverished conditions in sub-Saharan Africa where there's intermittent electricity and no technical expertise. And it turns out that if you develop a really robust bulletproof operating system that just works all the time and doesn't need a technical expert standing by to keep it working, that that's really useful to people in the developed world too. And it's the operating system that I use on my computer too. So we get these dividends because sometimes we underestimate how useful it would be to design products that are also useful for people in the developing world. And also, this allows people in the developing world to collaborate with each other across time and space. So Ubuntu is also 
the environment that has been most thoroughly uh, localized into, into Brazilian Portuguese, because Brazil may not have a lot of money, but it's bursting with technical expertise and with people who want locally appropriate technology and who are delighted to uh, cut their teeth figuring out how to localize this stuff into uh, their own environment. Um, so all of this stuff is what you get when you have interoperability and when there isn't a law that says you can't interoperate. And um, that's important as it goes, but it's not the main attraction. It, it, it's, it's actually just a secondary effect. I think the main, main attraction that you, that you get when you um, decide to solve social problems by controlling people's computers is that you lose transparency because of this, this function where you can't allow someone whose interests are adverse to the manufacturer to know how the device works. Someone whom the manufacturer views as the enemy can't be allowed to know how the device works. And that transparency is vital. Um, I have a friend who's a, uh, who's a Bostonian, and she says, using your signal lights is giving intelligence to the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> and when you have that mindset, you can immediately see how the world becomes a much harder to navigate place. And if knowing how your computer works is intelligence given to the enemy, that's in big trouble. That makes big trouble. Uh, an example of this, in 2005, Sony BMG, one of the record labels, decided that they wanted to make sure that people would stop ripping the CDs that they made. And so they shipped out 51 CD titles, 6 million copies of these discs approximately, that were designed so that the first time you put them in your CD-ROM drive, they would covertly and silently install software on your computer that changed your computer's operating system. They changed your computer's operating system so that any program or file that started with dollar sign, SYS, dollar sign, would be invisible to the operating system. So if there was a file in a folder called dollar sign, SYS, dollar sign, I can't let you do that, Dave.exe, and you asked your computer, is that file there? It would swear that it wasn't because it couldn't see it. And if you asked it, is there a program running called hell9000.exe, dollar sign, SYS, dollar sign, hell9000.exe, it would say, no, no, no such program running here. And importantly, well, so why did they do this? Well, they did this because they then installed a program that started with dollar sign, SYS, dollar sign, that ran at startup and, and stayed resident and always looked to see whether you were ripping a CD. And if you were, tried to shut it down because that's what they wanted to do. But your virus checker, how does it know what programs are on your computer? It asks the operating system. And if your operating system can't see any file that starts with dollar sign, SYS, dollar sign, then any virus that starts with dollar sign, SYS, dollar sign would be invisible to anything that you might use to erase it or detect it. And immediately virus writers started writing viruses starting with dollar sign, SYS, dollar sign. Because any time you have a hole in an immune system, you have opportunistic infection. And Dan Kaminsky, the security researcher, determined that between two and 300,000 US military and government networks were compromised by the Sony root kit, which is what this, this malicious software is called. The only way to stop people from modifying their computers to let them do the stuff they want to do is to put a moat in that computer's eye, to design it so that the instructions it gets from afar are more important than the instructions that it gets from the person who's holding it in their hands. For DRM to work, the existence and particulars of its secrecy must also be a secret. You can't know how DRM works, so you also can't know if it's doing something that it shouldn't be doing. And there's a parallel here to our modern spook craze surveillance happy society, because spies will tell us that for spying to work, the spying must not only be secret, but the secrets about the spying must also be secret. We have a secret court that rules on a secret interpretation of a secret law based on secret evidence, and that ruling is also a secret. And that kind of secrecy about secrecy is a poison, and it rots societies from the inside out. And that is the real cost of using digital locks to solve social problems. When you add a digital lock to a system, you create this legal mandate, this requirement for opacity, for weak security. Consider um, the revelations we got from the Snowden leaks that the NSA, and its partners in the UK, GCHQ, have been spending a quarter billion dollars a year on two programs, Bull Run and Edge Hill, to weaken the security of devices so that they can spy on them because it is in their interest for your computer not to be secure so that they can crack it open and look at you just in case you're doing something wrong. Your network infrastructure has been deliberately flawed and anyone who's as smart as they are 
can also break into your devices and spy on you. And it is statistically unlikely that the person who came up with that system is the smartest person in the world. And so someone else out there in the world is going to figure this stuff out. And there's a great example of this from uh, the very recent history. Last year, just before Christmas, there's a, every year there's a, a conference held, in, or just after Christmas, between Christmas and New Year's, a conference held in Germany called the Chaos Communications Congress. And it's a, uh, a technical convention thrown by the Chaos Communications Club, who are freewheeling German anarcho-hacker awesome dudes. And um, <laughs> on, on uh, the last day of the conference, the showstopper of the conference was this guy named Jacob Applebaum who's an American who worked for WikiLeaks and lives in exile in Germany because he believes if he comes back here, he'll be arrested. And Jake uh, got up on stage and he presented something called the Tailored Access Operations Manual, TAO. Now TAO, they're like the cue to the NSA's James Bond. They develop all the tools that the other spies use to, to spy on people. So if you want to spy on someone with an iPhone, they have a catalog full of iPhone exploits that you can use to spy on that iPhone. If you want to spy on someone with Android, they've got a catalog full of Android exploits. If there's someone running an old Sun workstation, they've got that too. They've got all the exploits, they know how to use them. They found them and they kept them a secret. They found all these bugs and they kept them a secret, these flaws, so that they could weaponize them. On the basis of a doctrine called no bus. Nobody but us is smart enough to find these bugs. So if we keep them a secret from the manufacturer and keep them from being patched, not only will nobody else exploit them and do anything bad to our national security, but also they will re remain unpatched over the long term so that we can always get at them and use them to spy on bad guys. It's like the best of all possible worlds. So Jake stands up and he presents the, the manual and he says, and guess what? You see this exploit for the iPhone? This thing that lets you take over an iPhone and listen through the microphone and watch through the camera, get all the keystrokes, get the location data off of it, gather all the storage data, uh, all the data off the storage. You see this? Yesterday, without my planning it or knowing it in advance, two security researchers stood on this stage and presented that bug, which they had independently discovered. And again, statistically unlikely that there's only two people in the world who found this bug, one of them working for the NSA and the other one presenting at, at Chaos Communications Congress. The chances are that somewhere out there is someone else who found that bug, and that person may have been doing something very bad indeed, because it's not just spies who want to operate your camera remotely, who want to listen to your microphone, who want to harvest your keystrokes and get all the files off your hard drives. It's also just crooks and creeps and stalkers and perverts and weirdos. So a couple of months ago, the FBI raided uh, um, 100 people all over the world who were, um, they called themselves RATTERS, uh, R-A-T, and RAT stands for Remote Access Trojan, which is just a grandiose name for a program that takes over a computer, accesses all of its, its sensors and its storage. And these RATTERS mostly are, are young men, and they mostly target young women. And what they do is they trick young women using social media into either visiting a website where their computer is automatically compromised because their browser has a flaw in it, that maybe the NSA knew about but didn't bother to tell Microsoft or Apple or Google or Firefox about, or maybe it's one that they've discovered that nobody knows about yet. Or they trick them into installing a program. And once that is resident on their computer, their computer now responds to the router, and the router can covertly operate it. And the router captures um, uh, compromising images of these young women in the nude incidentally passing in front of their computers because our computers are there in our bedrooms and in our toilets and they know everything about us. Um, and uh, they also capture their logins and passwords for their social media accounts, and then they email the young women and they blackmail them. They say, here's the naked photos I have of you, here's your login for Facebook, if you don't want me to put these photos on Facebook, you will have to perform sex acts on camera for me. And the ratters had between 100 and 400 victims each, some of them had more, some of them had less, but they, that was kind of a good ballpark number. Um, so many of their victims were minor children. Uh, and it's not an isolated incident. Uh, last year, Miss Teen USA, Cassidy Wolf, called the FBI because she was being blackmailed by a ratter. Back then, we didn't call them ratters, we called them sextortionists. We're still trying to come up with a name for this that sounds sinister enough to actually make people realize just how freakishly bad this is. Um, and uh, this guy had over 140 victims, including a minor child in the United Kingdom where I live, so their victims are, are global. Some ratters don't sexually exploit young women. Some ratters just want your bank details because they want to clean out your bank account. Um, some ratters want your health details. Some ratters want to blackmail you in other ways. Some ratters are conducting uh, industrial espionage. But when you think about all the stuff that's in your computer, 
that a compromise of your computer is a compromise of just about everything in your life and, and more. Um, and uh, so this issue of whether or not you're allowed to know how your computer works is an issue that is only going to gain urgency um, because the idea of breaking a computer is so attractive to so many people who think what could possibly go wrong. Uh, last year, the Federal Trade Commission settled with um, seven companies that, make, that do rent to own for laptops. That's when you can't afford a laptop, so you pay for it on the monthly installment plan, paying for it several times over before it's yours because owning a laptop is so critical to being a part of the 21st century that even if you are poor, you need to own one, and this is the only way to own it. So there's seven rent-to-own companies, and, and a company called um, Designerware of Northeast Pennsylvania that made laptop theft, anti-theft software. Well, what's laptop anti-theft software? It's a rat. It's a thing that lets you turn on the camera and the microphone and grab, grab all the keystrokes and figure out where the laptop is and so on. And yeah, you could use that to recover the laptops, but that's not what these seven companies and designer were doing. They were just spying on their customers. And by their admissions, they stipulated that they were making videos of their customers in the nude and having sex. They were making customers of their uh, of videos of their customers' children in the nude. They were um, intercepting their confidential uh, communications, including privileged communications with their lawyers, including medical documents, including bank logins and passwords. They were plundering their hard drives for funny files to pass around the office. And the FTC, as you would hope, they, uh, they said, you must not do this anymore uh, unless you put it somewhere in your license agreement, in which case you can just go on doing this for as long as you want. Because we are not yet alive to just how disproportionate and terrible it is to um, have computers that you sit in front of all day and that know everything about you and that are designed to treat you as their enemy. The bad news is that this stuff isn't slowing down. Because everything we do from now on will have a computer in it, and every problem we have will suggest the same solution. Make me a computer that can run every program, except for the one that I fear, or that, um, that costs me money, or that I don't like. Um, and this runs up against an important theoretical problem in computer science, which is something called Turing completeness. So Alan Turing didn't just invent modern cryptography, that, that Alice and Bob stuff that I was talking about before. He was also part of the group that invented computers as we understand them, along with uh, uh, mathematicians like John von Neumann at the Princeton Institute. Alan Turing and his colleagues designed computers that uh, were an enormous leap forward from the kind of calculating engines that we had before we had computers. It used to be that if you wanted uh, to solve a problem, you would build a computer that could only solve that problem. So if you needed to solve quadratic equations, you'd make a quadratic equation solving machine. If you wanted to calculate ballistic tables, you'd make a ballistic table machine. But Alan Turing figured out a way that you could get a computer that was programmable, that could run any program that you could express symbolically. And in some really important, subtle, uh, theoretical way, every computer is equivalent in that they can all run the same programs. Now admittedly, some of them run them much more slowly than other ones. Right? So the, the computers made into vacuum tubes and analog switches that Alan Turing was working with, um, they would run Quake or, or Counter-Strike or, um, or, or Skyrim so slowly that it would take thousands of years to have any fun with them. <laughs> but um, they would still run. Right? If, you could, if you could translate them so that, so that they, could, they could be understood, they would still run. Um, and this kind of completeness actually seems to lurk everywhere, even in places we don't want it. Like programmers, they often come up with like toy programming languages that are only supposed to do one or two things, like let you blink the text on your MySpace page. And they go, okay, we gotta make sure that this only does this one thing and not everything, because if it does everything, people will write viruses in it. We don't want them to do that. So we're just gonna make a thing that lets you like lay out a page. And then someone looks at it and kind of cocks their head and goes, this is Turing Complete too, And at every technical conference, you will see people standing up at every security conference, standing up and going, guess what? This other toy scripting environment that's only supposed to do three things, Turing Complete, and here's some malware I wrote in it. One after another, after another, you know, um, uh, PostScript, there's people who write malware inside a page description for your printer. So you print out their resume and it takes over your printer and then it, it, it uses your printer to probe your whole network and take over all the other computers on and then tunnels outside of your firewall. It's, it's really glorious stuff. Um, <laughs> there's even a proof of concept where you can use a sufficiently large Magic the Gathering deck to be Turing complete. <laughs> you know what we don't have? 
Turing complete minus one. We don't have a model for computer that can run every program except for the one that upsets you. Our closest approximation for a computer that can run every program that uh, interoperates with your 3D printer but can't run the program that prints out a gun, or the self-driving car that can run all the driving programs except for the one that lets you drag race, or the um, uh, biological printer that lets you run all of the programs except for the one that prints out ricin. Uh, the closest approximation we have is a computer with spyware on it that you're not allowed to know how it works, and that if some creep can figure out how to make it work, they can get it to attack you in lots of terrible ways. Um, lawmakers labor under a terrible fallacy that they can make a computer just a little bit pregnant, that they can find a way to weaken its security, to weaken the security of people who use computers, because remember, information doesn't want to be free, but people do, and that that weakness will be contained to them and their uses and not spread out and find its way into other places. So for example, there's laws that say that all data switches have to be designed so that police officers can serve warrants on them and listen in on the conversations that go through them um, without having to actually go down to the data center and plug stuff in. So all the switches used by the phone company have what are called lawful interception backdoors. And the idea is that only cops get to use these, um, and they'll only use them when they have a warrant. But routinely, people who aren't cops, or cops who don't have warrants, or cops who work for governments that we don't think of as legitimate, use these to compromise people, including uh, people at the highest levels of government. So for example, Greece, where they don't have a lawful interception law, um, someone turned on the lawful interception backdoors on all of their main telecom switches during the, uh, the Olympic bid in 2005-06 and listened in on the Prime Minister for a month and then backed out again and forgot to erase the logs, which is how we know that it happened. Right? It is really unlikely that you can make a computer just a little bit insecure and contain that just a little bit of insecurity to itself. Uh, when Gaddafi's government fell, activists who went into the data centers of the secret police discovered that the Gaddafi government had been sourcing lawful interception appliances from the West that allowed them to spy on the whole country and figure out who to disappear into the torture chambers. And these are tools that are only supposed to be used by the good guys, but they don't understand if they're being used by good guys or bad guys. All they understand is, find me this pattern in all the packet stream, and they, they dutifully do it. The NSA, you'd think that the NSA being one of the most secretive and disciplined organizations in the world, notwithstanding the recent leaks, the NSA had never leaked anything before Snowden. There had never been a public leak of NSA documents before Snowden in the entire history of the organization. So you'd think that they'd be really good at this stuff. But one of the things we learned from the Snowden leaks is that this giant surveillance apparatus, this multi-billion dollar global enterprise of spying on everyone in the world, that the analysts who work for the NSA, who are themselves very closely watched, routinely use this to spy on and stalk cute girls. Um, the NSA calls this the intelligence that they get from signals SIGINT, they intercept uh, messages. They call the intelligence they get from human beings when they, when they ask someone something, they call that HUMINT. They call this LOVEINT, and it happens so often they have a name for it, right? So if the NSA can't make sure that its analysts aren't abusing this system, which is internal and locked down and you have to have clearance to use it, what is the likelihood that your device which has been designed to be insecure so that you can only install software that comes from Apple on it, so Apple can always get 30% of the, of the price of the, all the software sold in the App Store, or that is designed so that you can only watch Netflix movies in them while you're connected to Netflix and not save them and share them on, what is the likelihood that no one will discover those secrets and go on and attack you? Now, nerds who encounter this stuff tend not to take it very seriously, because they say, you know what? I can break this stuff. I understand Alice and Bob and Carol. Um, and if I can break this stuff, what's the big deal? It doesn't really bind on me. And that complacency is the most dangerous thing about all of this stuff. Because it doesn't matter how good your own OPSEC, your own operational security is, information security is a team sport. If everybody you communicate with is compromised, then you're compromised too. <coughs> I'm a, I've never been a Gmail user. I've posted my own email for like going on 20 years now. I've got it on a box in a rack in Toronto maintained by a very good bogus sysadmin who knows what he's about. I'm still a Gmail user though because everybody I correspond with is a Gmail user. It doesn't matter how good my mail security is because everybody else keeps their mail on Google where the NSA can get at it. And so if you assume that just because you've solved this problem for you, the problem is solved, you've made a mistake. 
If you are someone who is technologically apt, this is up to you. Because we're building the future, and we can build spyware rootkits into our computers. We can put moats in their eyes and make a future that turns computers into levers for allowing petty tyrants to become global monsters. Or we can resist. We can refuse to wave our hands at the marketing department when they insist that like new is the same as new. We can refuse to wave off the politicians who say, well, it's expedient to break computers in this way today, and we'll solve those problems when they crop up tomorrow. And in particular, we can defend the web, because the web is under unprecedented attack from um, a most unlikely quarter. So Netflix is, is desperately concerned that the studios will stop giving it movies. And they want to make sure that you can't save the movies that you stream, and that you can't download them to your disk. And the problem is that there is no such thing as streaming. Streaming is a consensus hallucination. The only way for you to watch a movie on your computer is to download it. Right? Your computer is not connected to Netflix by a system of mirrors and speaking tubes. The only way that an image can show up on your screen is if the bits for that image are downloaded to your computer. Netflix thinks that when it sends you a movie, and you try to save that movie that your computer will say, I can't let you do that, Dave. And the only way to make that work is to break your computer, and that's the only way they can keep their partners happy. And so they went to the three major browser vendors, Microsoft, Apple, and Google, and they got them all to agree to put deep hooks in their browsers that will stop you from doing this, from saving the videos that show up in your browser. And the World Wide Web Consortium, which has historically been a very staunch friend of openness and freedom and transparency on the internet, the body that makes the core standards on which the internet runs. The World Wide Web Consortium said, well, if all the important stuff in browsers is now happening behind smoke-filled rooms because we won't do DRM, then I guess we'd better do DRM too. And once they did that, the Mozilla Foundation, who made the only browser that didn't have DRM in it, announced that they were putting DRM in it too. And now, in everything that can be controlled from a web interface, we will have this reservoir of long-lived vulnerabilities that can be used to attack you uh, for by spies, by crooks, by identity thieves, by lawyers, by anyone who discovers a bug that's lurking latent in there and that you aren't allowed to know about it. Orwell theorized that we were going to uh, lose our freedom and humanity to a society that used all pervasive surveillance. Huxley believed that we might lose our humanity to a society that used entertainment to uh, keep us uh, docile and placid. It turns out you can Huxley your way into the full Orwell. It turns out that entertainment can be used as a backdoor for this kind of surveillance. When people want to add controls to our technology, they always cite one of four rubrics, the four horsemen of the infocalypse. They say it's about child porn, uh, terrorism, uh, piracy, or organized crime. And when the NSA says we need to have holes in our devices and backdoors in all of our networks, they say that it's because they're fighting a war between extremism and freedom. But the real extremism <coughs> is the idea that um, you should use computers to enslave people and not to set them free. It doesn't matter to me whether the reason that you want to weaken the security of the network that is the nervous system of the 21st century is because you want to catch terrorists or because you want to plan a terrorist attack. Either one of those is an illegitimate, way, is Ill, an illegitimate excuse for breaking the internet. And people who want to do that are on the wrong side of history. We spend a lot of time these days arguing about whether technology will make us free or whether it will enslave us. We hear about these terrible things that the NSA is able to do with our computers or that ratters are able to do. And sometimes we're tempted to think that the whole thing is a bit of an exercise in futility, that maybe we should chuck it all out. There is no way we're going to chuck out the internet and start over again, at least not uh, in a way that doesn't end up with all of us digging through the ruins of civilization with long poles looking for canned goods. So we're stuck with the internet, for better or for worse, and it's time to stop asking whether the internet makes us free, more free or less free. And it's time to start asking how we can make the tech that makes us more free, what we can do to improve our freedom using technology. And it's important when bad things happen to people, especially en masse because of the internet, to raise the alarm. It's important to know, for example, 
that in Syria and Egypt at checkpoints, you are made to log into your social media so that the people running the checkpoints can see whether you're connected with the wrong side, and if you are, haul you off to jail or shoot you on the spot. It's important to know that computers make us vulnerable in important ways, but not because it should make us want to abandon computers altogether or declare them to be ideological bankrupt, but just so we can know where we need to focus our energies and just so we can know how urgent the question is. But in case you had any doubt, the question is as urgent as an urgent thing can be. Um, whether you're a toolmaker or a hacker or someone who um, uh, is willing to call up your lawmaker and give them a piece of your mind, this is an issue that we all need to be working on because it's the issue that unlocks everything else. Now, I'm an artist and I am lucky enough to earn my living in this improbable way of selling my entertainment product that helps you pass the long slog from the cradle to the grave. And I think that these digital locks are, are, are rubbish and of no good, to, no use to me and that I can earn my living without them. But even if I was convinced that they were absolutely necessary to my living, I would still oppose them. And I would oppose them because as important as it is to me to be able to make up stories, and, important, and, and as nice as it is to me to have the money to feed my family and take my daughter on vacations, it's much more important for me to bequeath to her a world that is open and free and that she can live in as a free person without all pervasive surveillance and censorship and control. I would rather go out and get a real job. <laughs> so I think that you should want a free and fair world more than any of these other things too. And I think that we don't have to make the choice. I think we can have entertainment at the same time as this. I think we just have to be willing to stand up to people who don't understand the technical dimension of what they're demanding. People who think that all they're asking is for people not to steal their movies and don't understand that they're also asking for computers to be broken in these foundational ways. There's no way that we're going to be able to fight any kind of political struggle of any meaning without free computers and open networks. And the good news is that just as Turing completeness is waiting out there in the universe for us, so is the ability to keep secrets that we can use to organize. Um, so one of the things that Alan Turing taught us is that we can make ciphers, we can make scrambling systems that allow you, using the computer in your pocket, to scramble a message so deeply and thoroughly that even if all the hydrogen atoms in the universe were given over to doing nothing but trying to extract those secrets, grinding away as little nanoscale computers, we would run out of universe before that message was brute forced open. This is a new thing on the face of the world, right? That, that people, everyday people, can keep secrets from the people in power. And it completely changes the balance of power that we've historically had, where we've always had opacity and privacy for the rich and powerful, and transparency for the poor and for the powerless. And now we can reverse that. We, WikiLeaks has shown us that the rich and powerful can be made transparent. And cryptography shows us that everyday people can have um, privacy. Now, if you've tried these tools, you may have noticed that they're kind of hard to use. They're a bit wonkish. And that's not because there is anything inherently hard to use about security. It's because historically, the only people who understood the issues well enough to want that kind of deep technical privacy were people who were deeply technical. And so nobody ever bothered to make stuff that was fit for use by people who weren't deeply technical. In the same way that before desktop publishing, all, uh, all typesetting involved, assumed that you knew an awful lot about type. And after desktop publishing, it turned out that about 95% of what we thought of as esoteric deep type knowledge could be expressed in Word. And then the other 5%, which is very important, uh, was stuff that was hard to learn. Uh, but you could get a lot of it done just sitting there at your desktop. In the same way, cryptography, uh, it turns out, and security, it turns out, is something that doesn't have an inherent complexity or an inherent difficulty. It's just never been challenged to be usable by civilians, by everyday people. And last September, three months after the Snowden leaks, uh, the Pew Internet uh, Life Project surveyed Americans and found that 87% of Americans had taken some step to secure their privacy on the internet. Now, because they were using tools for everyday people, almost nothing that they could do gave them any security. Because there is no tech tick box in any of the things that you're using, in all likelihood, that actually gives you privacy. Um, most of those are there to just sort of either confuse you or make you feel vaguely better, or, or maybe both. Um, and in the case of Facebook, it's just a Skinner box to teach you to undervalue your privacy. Um, and so that's kind of scary news on its face, but people 
all over the world, people in the nonprofit sector, people in the investment community set up and said, wait a second, 87% of American internet users want something and no one's making it? That sounds like an opportunity. And there's all kinds of tools being developed today, and the tool suite just keeps getting easier. On the anniversary of the Snowden leaks on June, on June the 5th, a coalition of non-governmental organizations called Reset the Net came together, and they made a pack of tools for Mac, Windows, Linux, Android, and iOS at pack.resetthenet.org that you can download and start securing your stuff right away. And that's great news, because if you make yourself more secure, you make the project of mass surveillance harder. And this especially matters if you happen to believe, and you're probably wrong, that you have nothing to hide. Um, if you have nothing to hide, it's not because of clean living. It's because you have the great fortune, as I did, to be born into privilege that you didn't earn. Right? I'm white and cis and hetero and able-bodied and all the rest of it. And so I have a lot less to hide than a lot of people, not because of anything I did. And the people who have something to hide, the people who need privacy more than I do, those people are, are already compromised and have a hard time advocating for it because of their, their already compromised position. And so it is beholden on all of us who lucked in, in the lottery into being able to advocate without being in this position of compromise. It is beholden on all of us to act on behalf of our sisters and brothers and parents and aunties and uncles and kids who do have something to hide through no fault of their own to advocate and to use this privacy technology to give them cover and to make it important and part of the everyday use of the internet. So we don't have to be just cyber realists when it comes to the internet. We can be cyber optimists. We can believe in the project of securing the, the network and using it to coordinate our struggle for freedom. We can believe that we can seize the means of information and use it to free the world. And I hope that you'll join me in that. Thank you. We have some time for questions before I uh, deface your books and render them non-returnable. Uh, <laughs> I remind you that a long rambling statement followed by what do you think of that is technically a question, but it's not one of the good ones. <laughs> uh, and I think there's a mic back there. Yeah, you can use this one, or if you raise your hand, I can come around. What do you use on your phone, software-wise? Uh, I, I, my general uh, heuristic for phones is whenever I smash one, which is depressingly often, I, uh, I, I get uh, whatever the current Nexus is, because they, they're always easy to unlock, and then I unlock them and read them and install uh, a version of Android called CyanogenMod on them, which is a very privacy-oriented version of Android. Um, and uh, it's not as good as I would like it to be, but it's better than, the, uh, it's better than nothing. It's better than the stock Android. It's much more private. For one thing, if you've ever installed an Android app, you know that you get this take it or leave it offer with an app that says, like, in order to use this app, you have to allow it to operate your camera and know what your phone number is. And if you don't like it, you can lump it. Um, and what CyanogenMod does is say, um, let the app think it knows my location, but don't let the app know my location. <laughs> and uh, that's that. I find that to be just an excellent feature. Go ahead. So I've, for a long time, I've been in IT for way too long, but um, I've always kind of uh, advised friends and people that uh, never think that your stuff's secure, so you might as well have your conversation out in the open. If somebody's listening, maybe you'll convince them otherwise. Um, I like the idea of better tools that can do cryptology and kind of confuse and frustrate people who are trying to keep us out from uh, knowledge. I guess the question I have for you is, um, what's the critical mass that tips the scale that you see to make the corporation say, hey, you know, it's not worth it any longer? Uh, how do we get to that point is my frustration with it all. So Lawrence Lessig talks about four forces that act on society. He talks about legal code, software code, normative code, and market code, markets. And I think that um, the post-Snowden era has had all of those forces firing well. So normatively, 87% of Americans went out and said, I want something that makes me private. Um, and that's totally different from the situation before Snowden. Commercially, market-wise, a bunch of companies said, 
uh, instead of having the surveillance business model, we can have the anti-surveillance business model. Not because we're ideologically committed to privacy, but because maybe we can steal some of the billions Facebook's making by offering the, the privacy business model instead of the surveillance business model. Um, and there's tons of people out there who are thinking about this stuff from a market perspective. Legally, uh, there had been a long period where there was no uh, facts and evidence about what the NSA was doing. And whenever we did have some facts and evidence, it was very hard to get enough to, to get standing to, to make legal changes, either in Congress or in the courts. So for example, in 2005, uh, a very brave whistleblower named Mark Klein, who'd worked as a technician for AT&T, walked into Electronic Frontier Foundation's offices in San Francisco and uh, with a sheaf of documents, and he said, my last job for AT&T, they asked me to build a secret room for the NSA at the Folsom Street Switching Center and to, to put a beam splitter in the main fiber optic trunk and to run off a copy of the internet for the NSA without any um, uh, warrant. And EFF started suing. Uh, but every time we got to court, um, and we said, we these documents, you know, as part of our discovery process from the NSA, the NSA said, state secrecy, sorry, uh, and we couldn't get anywhere. Now, the Snowden leaks have put a lot of that stuff out in the open. So, for example, EFF represented for a while um, uh, lawyers from CARE, from the uh, uh, Center for uh, Arab American, C-A-I-R, for American, uh, American Islamic Relations, the, the, that's it, the Council for uh, American Islamic Relations, um, lawyers who believed that the NSA had violated their attorney-client privilege by spying on them without a warrant. And um, we couldn't get, the court said, well, you don't know for sure, right? I mean, you know, right? Because they had all of AT&T and all of Verizon, but you don't know for sure, you don't know specific facts. But this week, we saw a Snowden leak published that said these care lawyers were subject to surveillance by the NSA um, while they communicated with their, with their um, with their clients, and that's kind of a big no-no, and so that gives uh, new legal lights to this stuff. So that's law, and that's norms, and now we're also getting code and markets. So I think all of this stuff is shifting, um, and I think that the idea that if you just put it all out there, nothing bad will happen to you, uh, it doesn't work, and it doesn't work for a few reasons. One is that you may have something that you don't want out there, right? You, you may just not want the rest of the world to know that you're a rape survivor, or that you're um, n not cisgender, or that you have a disease that might make your employer unwilling to hire you. There may be lots of reasons not to put it all out there. The other reason is that um, an enormous amount of what is done in the name of security is not done because bad guys need to be caught. It's done because of civil service empire building, where catching a certain number of bad guys every year, whether or not they're bad guys, gets you budget that, that lasts from one year, rolls over from one year to the other. And so that's why we have a no-fly list full of babies, right? It's not that anyone seriously believes that babies are terrorists. It's that if you have a big no-fly list, then you can satisfy the security syllogism, right? Something must be done there, I just did something. And so having a bunch of data out there just invites people who have a quota, effectively, to say, well, I've looked at your, I've, I've, I've scrutinized your data, and I find that if I squint at it this way, it matches the pattern that I'm looking for. And now we just don't have uh, uh, Orwell and Huxley. We, we get to throw Kafka in, too. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you. Yeah. Corey, you've talked about uh, how you publish your works both in book form and bookstores and also online yeah. without DRM and so forth. Is that still working for you, and how do you see that expanding to the rest of the market for other authors? So uh, the questions about the way that I publish my books, they're all available as DRM-free downloads, and as well as uh, uh, commercial books in stores, and commercial DRM-free e-books in all, all the traditional e-book stores, Amazon and, and Google and Kobo and so on. Um, and how does that work for me? Well, it's still working for me. Uh, the last book was a four-week New York Times bestseller, and. Um, uh, the next book for adults that I'm working on, Utopia, it, it, my agent thinks that we'll get a nice big fat advance for it, so that's very nice. Uh, I'm, I'm rolling out a new version of my own site that uses some of the stuff we've learned from the Humble eBook Bundle, which is a name your price bundle for downloading, and that will allow me to be a retailer for my own eBooks. So I share with my publishers, but you can name your price when you download from me, and that price can be zero. Uh, or you can change your mind and come back and give more, and that, that I think is an important piece of the strategy. Um, I think that the way that this stuff is developing is that publishers are learning 
that when they believed the tech companies that said, if you put DRM on your ebooks, we will uh, stop them from being pirated, that they were being tricked. Um, all of the ebook DRM is broken the day it's released, and all the ebooks that have DRM on them can be pirated easily all over the internet. But because the law says only the company that makes the DRM can, can uh, remove it, it means that if a company sells a million dollars worth of ebooks through Amazon and then gets into a dispute with Amazon and wants to leave and take its customers with it and go to Google Play, that those customers are not allowed to convert their ebooks to play in Google's reader. And so they have to maintain two separate libraries. It's like every time you buy a book from, from Amazon, you would have to buy a bookcase from Ikea. You know, it's, it just, it's just a weird idea that, that your reader is somehow locked to your books. Um, and this has become extremely important in the last month because one of the big five publishers, Hachette, um, had a dispute with Amazon. They were the first of the big five to uh, uh, have their standard deal with Amazon run out and come up for renewal. And Amazon wanted a much bigger discount than they were prepared to give. And when Hachette said no, Amazon said, fine, we're just not going to sell your author's books anymore. Now, Hachette is like the most doctrinaire DRM advocate in the big five, and so all the ebooks they've ever sold have DRM on them. And um, they uh, are um, not able to go to uh, Google and, and to Kobo and to Apple and say, uh, tell you what, let's all gang up together on Amazon. We're going to release an app that converts all of your Hachette books to be, to be Apple books uh, uh, instead of Amazon books. And we'll offer a 50% discount on Hachette authors until Amazon wises up through everyone except Amazon. Right? That's, that's like hardball. Right? That's a thing that they would be able to do, except that they put DRM in all their ebooks. Um, and so while a pirate who wants to break DRM, it's like it's not worth Amazon's while to sue that person or figure out where they are. But if Hachette breaks Amazon's DRM, like everybody knows where Hachette is, right? You can find there the picture of their building on 16th of Londismo in Paris on Google Earth. It's a big building. They have a lot of money. And so they would be a great target for a lawsuit. And you'd think that they'd be more strategic about this. Hachette is owned by this big diversified multinational that owns a bunch of arms dealers. And you'd think that a company that, that makes you know, materiel for warfare would be more strategic about this stuff, a little more Sun Tzu. But it, you know, Amazon's got its own uh, space program. So they, they're looking a couple of hops ahead of the publishers here. I think that this is going to end really badly for Hachette. I think Amazon has all the leverage here, and I think the other publishers are going to wake up and go, holy crap, because all our deals are coming up for renewal. We had better start thinking about this hard. So that's what I think is going to happen. Uh, in, the, uh, in the back. Yeah, go ahead. All right, you mentioned it. So can you tease us a little bit more about Utopia? Yeah, sure. So I'm working on this book, Utopia. It's loosely a prequel to Down and Out of the Magic Kingdom. It's, it's not actually in the continuity, but it's kind of about, if you ever read my first novel, Down and Out of the Magic Kingdom, uh, it's a book of, about a world where there's no more scarcity, where there's, everybody lives forever, and, and you can have as much as you want of anything. And this is about the revolutionary period in which the people who depend on scarcity for their privilege and position in society have a total freak out about the fact that <laughs> scarcity is coming to an end. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a book that's inspired by some of my recent reading, a book named uh, uh, Paradise Built in Hell by Rebecca Solnit, who's an historian who studies the way that people behave in disasters and the huge gap between the way that um, stories tell us people behave in disasters and the way that people actually behave in disasters. Normally, in disasters, people are mostly pretty darn good to each other. Um, they go over to their neighbor's house, not with a shotgun, but with a covered dish. And, um, that, that has been the story since the 1905 earthquake. It was the story in Katrina, despite what you may have heard. It was the story in Haiti. And there's this thing called elite panic, which is the, the, the certain knowledge among sociopathic uh, people who live at the top of the hill in the biggest house with the tallest gates, that because if the situations were reversed and the lights went out, they would be heading to the top of the hill with pitchforks, that the pitchforks must be coming for them. And so in the, in the Solnit, tracks this back to, to the 1905 earthquake and, and, um, and what uh, happened then. And among other things, uh, General Funston um, decided that the, the fires that were going on were an invitation to disorder and looting. And so he'd heard that there was this thing called a fire break where you could blow up buildings and make a fire break, but he didn't know how to do it, but he thought he probably could manage it. So he took his soldiers out and blew up a bunch of buildings in San Francisco and burned down about a quarter of the city 
which burned because he wouldn't let anyone into the parts of the city that he'd set on fire because he was convinced that there were poor people going to loot things, because everyone knows poor people loot things. And so that's Elite Panic kind of in a nutshell. And so it's a book about Elite Panic. It's also inspired by Thomas Piketty and Capital in the 21st Century. And by all those adventure stories that I loved growing up, that are post-apocalyptic stories, where as soon as the lights go out, everyone does turn into a barbarian and goes and goes over the neighbor's house with a shotgun. Because as, as exciting as those stories are to read, um, they're uh, kind of blood libel on the human race. Um, that they, and I kind of want to have a story that makes people think really differently about what happens when the lights go out and when disaster strikes. So it's good fun to write. Um, it's about 75,000 words in. I'm hoping to have it done by Thanksgiving. Uh, my agent and my editor both read it and like it a lot, so uh, I think uh, it will do well. I hope it will do well. It's going to be a big fat book like Makers uh, for grown-ups. Yeah? I think that the uh, Eric Brynjolfs and Andrew McAfee second Machine Age book has a number of discussions and topics that sort of relate to what you're discussing, but one of the ones that they don't discuss that I'd like to ask you uh -huh. uh, about is the sort of the alternative to the digital box uh, model uh, that we might find in the, what you might describe as the 51% Bitcoin model, 51% right. of the, the users agree that X is X, right. that it is X. So, uh, yeah. what do you think about that sort of uh, alternative solution? So I think the, the question more broadly is like, if there are real problems that computers cause, what can we do to solve them? Is that, is that a fair right. kind of summary? And that's a question I've been thinking about for a long time, um, because I don't think it's incumbent on people who think that a solution doesn't work to have a solution, right? Like, I may not know why you have a headache, but that shouldn't stop me from saying, stop hitting your head against the wall, that's not helping. But <laughs> even so, it's always more compelling if you do have a solution. And uh, back when the first software-defined radios were coming into the field, these are radios that can change what kind of radio they are from a TV to an FM radio to an AM radio to an emergency services band or whatever by changing the software in them. The FCC was really worried that people would, you know, turn their baby monitors into airport control systems and make planes fall out of the sky. That's like the, the FCC's existential nightmare, right? I don't want planes to fall out of the sky either. So, um, what they had proposed was that there should be DRM on everything that was capable of being a radio, uh, and that the FCC would have to sign any code that could run on anything capable of being a radio, but that's every computer. And this is just like not a good idea. And so I went around and asked a bunch of astute hackers and programmers and people who know this stuff, what do you think an answer might be to this, to this problem? And the best answer I got came from a guy named Andrew Bunny Huang. And he's a very sharp technologist. He's the guy who broke the Xbox when he was at MIT. Um, most recently, he uh, uh, did a really successful crowdfunding campaign for a computer called the Novena, which is the first ever open from the ground up computer that uh, the BIOS and all the hardware on it are open. All the software and hardware in it are open and open to inspection. And um, really bright guy. And he said, well, you know, in a world of software-defined radios, all of our devices will have software-defined radios because why would you have just a hardwired Wi-Fi chip in your phone when you could have a software-defined radio that was Wi-Fi and GSM and CDMA and all the other protocols? So we're all going to have software-defined radios. And you know, the major problem with radio is not bad guys doing bad things. It's, the, um, it's people with broken devices and bad code. It's the shielding that slips on your computer and turns it into a spark gap generator that clobbers everything else in the neighborhood and stops it all from working. That's the actual proper problem with electronics. The bad guys are actually a subset of that. Um, and we already have this problem, right? We, even without bad guys, even without software-defined radios, we already have the problem that every now and again, all your radio stuff just stops working or your Wi-Fi stops working because something is not well designed or something has been modified or something has been broken in a way that causes it to interfere. What if all software-defined radios, which as a natural part of their functionality are always checking the spectrum to see what's going on, what if they cooperated with each other to find stuff that didn't look right? And when they saw stuff that really didn't look right, they logged it and signed it and sent it off to someone who could do something about it. Right? In the same way that like, what if we all had um, sensors on us that check the air for pathogens because we're worried about uh, our allergies and we're worried about bugs and so on. And then when they found those pathogens, 
they made they made reports of them if they looked anomalous and you agreed to it and that report could be used to spot bad stuff. That would be useful for finding flu outbreaks, but also bioterror, right? And he said, well, maybe we could do this with with what with wireless too. And the more I think about it, the more I think that that generally might be the model for all of this stuff because in general we have a lot more accidental bad stuff than deliberate bad stuff. And if you think about self-driving cars, you know there's the nightmare scenario with a self-driving car, which is like you know, the, the carry the self-driving car, right? <laughs> <laughs> but self-driving car, like we, it, even if we ever get to a day when all the cars are self-driving, it will come after a long period in which only some of the cars are self-driving. Because we're not going to one day say, guess what guys, tomorrow all the rolling stock in America comes off the road, go and get yourself a self-driving car. And um, people are terrible drivers. And uh, it would be, and self-driving cars are going to need to be able to do something about the fact that people are terrible drivers, like avoid them and not die. And one of the best tools that self-driving cars have that people don't is the ability to tell other self-driving cars about bad drivers they've seen. Um, that actually allows self-driving cars to kind of treat bad drivers as damage and right around them. And also creates a, a can rise to the level of a regulatory intervention or a, a, a policing intervention for really bad stuff like drunk driving and so on. And so, uh, again, like the the, the major problem of, the, of 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 self driving cars and of all the other information security problems we have is is human foible, human frailty, not human evil. And if you build out the the thing that actually addresses human frailty first. You get a long way towards solving human evil too, I hope. But I also know that banging your head against the wall doesn't help. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Talking about infosec being very gloom. If you don't do this, you're going to get hacked. You don't do that. If you wish to get a new library card, how many tips are you talking about? You're talking about? Yeah. How do you how do you talk about this stuff without scaring people and making them feel sad? I mean. <laughs> My experience is that kids actually love knowing how to, learning how to master technology and to keep secrets because kids understand what it means to be under surveillance. That's what being a kid is. <laughs> and actually, one of the great tragedies of the way that we do computers in schools is that um, any uh, institution that has federal funding under a law called the Communications Decency Act has to block bad content. Um, and they're not. It's it's hard to do that because like there isn't a room big enough to hold all the proofs that you need to find all the bad pages on the internet and put them into the bad bucket. And so there's always lots of bad stuff that they miss and always lots of good stuff that they catch. And, and but what's worse than that is that in order to make sure that kids in a school aren't looking at bad stuff, you have to um, capture everything they look at to see if it's bad stuff. And so you're spying on them. And even if you're not even looking at that stuff, even if no human ever looks at it, we can argue later about whether or not that counts as spying, um, it does mean that any step that a kid takes to protect her privacy on the network breaks your model for making sure she isn't looking at pornography. And that means that you have to punish kids who learn how to be private on the internet. And so we sit there wagging our fingers at them and saying, if you use Facebook, your privacy will go away and you'll never get it back, which is actually true. But then we say, if you do anything to protect your privacy from me, you're going to get kicked out of school. And it's like saying, if you smoke, you're going to get cancer, which is actually true. But if you say it while lighting a cigarette from the one that you're about to stuff out of the ashtray, your kids will know that you don't mean it. Right? <laughs> and so I think that at least with kids, this is a thing that we can talk about much more readily. I think um, with, with adults, it's, I think it's useful to talk to them about how um, even if there's nothing about them that is particularly interesting to a potential spy or a potential identity thief or whatever, even if there's nothing juicy about their lives per se, that oftentimes these things are, are crimes of opportunity. So I found a bug in this version of this browser. I'm going to do a survey of all the IP addresses on the internet and find five million people who have that browser and compromise them to see if I can get their bank details. And so um, practicing good information security uh, doesn't just protect you from these targeted attacks, but from these untargeted ones too. And a lot of it is set up and forget, right? A lot of the basic stuff is to just turn on the updates and, and run them when they arrive and, and do all that other stuff. 
And it's about understanding that this stuff is important, like brushing your teeth. And so there's a lot of scary reasons to brush your teeth. Uh, like Tutankhamun died of a dental abscess. Right? Your, your, your jaws are excitingly close to your uh, meninges, and so jaw infections turn into uh, um, meningitis, and you die a horrible, feverish death. Um, but, and sometimes you have to tell your, I speak as a parent, sometimes getting your kids to brush your teeth involves describing some of the horrible things that happen to them. <laughs> but once you have the habit, mostly it's just a thing that you do because it's the right thing to do and everyone brushes their teeth. Yeah. So you've told us how to talk to children about this, and you've told us how to talk to other adults about this. How do we talk to legislature, leg legislators, legislators about this? Because I, it's especially in the United States, and then by extension the rest of the world through the PCMA, we have this system with no campaign finance reform, and we've got corporate personhood, and I feel really helpless when I'm trying to yeah. explain to people in Congress in some little email form right. why they should vote against, you know, SEPA or, you know, whatever right. stupid piece of legislation is next up on the book. So how do we get lawmakers to do good stuff when they, there is this big corruption problem? And it is a corruption problem, and surveillance is a, a piece of the corruption problem in that um, uh, one of the drivers of surveillance is that uh, the benefits of surveillance, the financial benefits of surveillance accrue to private firms that supply surveillance technology, which means that they have surplus capital that they can use to lobby lawmakers to expand surveillance. The costs of surveillance are diffused among everyone who spy on which means that we don't get any access, excess capital that we can use to lobby our lawmakers not to spy on us. And so the ratchet tends to go in one direction. And as you, as you say, the lack of meaningful campaign finance reform is a huge barrier to this. So Lawrence Lessig, who I mentioned earlier, is someone who um, was uh, most known for a long time as a copyright activist, but who concluded that the real problem wasn't copyright, it was corruption. And that copyright was just one domain in which the evidence for policy was not the basis on which policy was conducted. That, that we knew what would work and what didn't work, or we would know in particular that something couldn't work, but we do it anyways because the, there were lawmakers who were beholden to uh, people who would get them reelected and who would stop them from being reelected if they didn't if they didn't act in this way. And it's it's not an exaggeration to say that Congress people spend about as much time as they do working the phones, calling donors, as they do sitting in legislature, uh, thinking about law. As soon as they get elected, it's like the thing you do when you get into your office is you figure out where you're going to sit for half of your working hours asking people for money that will help you get reelected so you can still have a job next time. Because if you choose not to, the person you're running against will. And so you will lose. Um, and so Lessig decided that the thing to do was to address corruption uh, on, at, uh, at its face. And he started a super PAC called Mayday, mayday.us. Uh, it raised a million dollars last month and five million dollars this month. And a super PAC is there to elect congressmen who will abolish super PACs. Um, <laughs> and his plan is to use the money that they've raised to run candidates in five races using five iterative, technology-driven election campaigning techniques to take the learning from that and use it to run a full bipartisan slate in, in the 2016 races uh, and get um, a Congress that will vote for meaningful finance reform and that will then give breathing room to whatever lawmakers there are who got into politics because they want to make a difference and they want that difference to be led by policy and not by their donors' interests. Um, and so that I think has some hope of winning. I don't know that it's, I don't know that it will work. I don't, I don't think it's a lock. Uh, but I think that it's a, a plausible thing anyway. It's a, it's a, it's a good way of, of starting this corruption fight because it's, it, it's really important. Uh, this, this thing you've identified that our policy doesn't reflect our best evidence. And, and you know. Um, one of the age-old problems of the human race is what uh, economists call negative externalities, which is this thing where um, someone does something bad, like polluting the water, that lets them save some money, but costs everyone else a lot more money than they're saving. But because the benefits of the pollution, the savings, are concentrated in the hands of the polluter, 
and the costs are diffused among all the people who need to buy water filters, then what you end up with is um, a situation where the polluter can afford to get lawmakers elected who will make it harder to sue and weaken the environmental rules that stop the pollution, and everybody else um, actually has less resource to fight against it. And one of the things that the internet makes much easier is solving collective action problems. Like we have Kickstarter, right, where we can all get together and use some threshold mechanism to get stuff. We have um, uh, 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 class action suits for people who are wronged, uh, but not class action suits for people who are defendants. So this has created all kinds of exciting new internet forms of corruption, like copyright trolling, where uh, companies will claim, like Warner Chappelle Music claims that it owns Happy Birthday. And every, everyone who's ever seriously investigated says Warner Chappelle doesn't own Happy Birthday. But the license fee they charge for Happy Birthday, if you want to put it in a movie or sing it in your restaurant, is a lot less than it would cost you to pay a lawyer to prove that they don't own Happy Birthday. And so they get to extort money from everybody for Happy Birthday. It's like a deadweight loss on society. And Warner Chappelle lobbies for more rights for people who claim to own the rights to music every chance they get. And so this is a kind of lather, rinse, repeat disaster. But imagine if you could do Kickstarter for Warner Chappelle Music, where you could say, from now on, um, instead of paying blood money to Warner Chappelle, I am going to, if, if a thousand other restaurateurs will agree not to pay for a license for Happy Birthday, so will I. And I'll take my license money and use it to pay a lawyer who will sue, who will defend me when Warner Chappelle Music sues me. And anyone that Warner Chappelle threatens to sue, instead of giving money to Warner Chappelle, can Google, oh my god, Warner Chappelle is suing me, and discover that they can just join this consortium of people who, if Warner Chappelle sues them, they will lose. And so this is an amazing possibility that's opened up by the kind of collective action that the internet makes possible. It's like the Magnificent Seven, right? One year, instead of paying off the bandits, you pay mercenaries to kill the bandits. Um, and, you know, it, it's just one of the many ways in which we can change the power dynamics using the collective action solving problem uh, power of the internet. So I think that's it for time. I'm going to go sit back there with our wonderful bookseller, and um, I hope you'll come by and say hello. Thank you.